the very rapid rise and the quicker fall of Congressman Aaron Schock. We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Judging by his Instagram feed, it looked like Congressman Aaron Schock had it all. Perhaps he had too much. We're going to talk about that and so much more, of course, this week on Capitol View. I am Amanda Vinicky, the State House Bureau Chief for Illinois Public Radio and WUIS. And I'm joined this week by WICS anchor reporter Adam Reif, also the Illinois Times, Patrick Gagel, and Andy Maloney of the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. So, Aaron Chalk, I have to confess, I actually did a story on him when I was a wee intern, and he was first inaugurated to the Illinois House because we're the same age. I think he's got me beat by like a couple of months. And it was even stunning then. He had won a spot on the Peoria School Board at the age of 18 and quickly became its president. He also then went on, became the youngest member to serve in the Illinois General Assembly ever. It's impressive. But, wow, <laughs> um, how fast the mighty they fall, right? He's been compared to Icarus. Well, Pat, why don't you begin and um, just talk about, I don't know, are, are you surprised that he actually resigned? Uh, I'm, I think nobody's surprised that he resigned, but that he resigned so quickly. Okay. Um, the things that came out were not really that bad. If you look at you know scandals of other people who have had to resign from office, um, by comparison, Usually, it's mean, not that bad. Scandal, sure. really horrible, horrible, horrible Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Um, by comparison, his stuff was not really that bad. And you probably, you know, a, a good PR agent probably could have explained away most of it. Um, Instead, of course, his PR agent was part of this downfall. <laughs> right. His, um, his <laughs> press guy had to quit because after some attention was focused on Congressman Schock, it came out that he'd made um, some anti-Semitic remarks as well as some racist remarks. So. Right. Uh, away went Ben Cole, but moving on. But um, basically, he, he resigned under under pressure, but it didn't really seem like the pressure was that intense um, to resign. It seemed like he, there was some speculation that maybe he was resigning ahead of something else that he thought might be coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And we don't know right now. There's nothing going on from a legal point of view. He hasn't been accused of anything. The Congressional Ethics Office was going to begin looking into his behavior, but once he's no longer a congressman, that takes effect March 31st, they will no longer really have jurisdiction. So let's go down the list. I mean, it all started February 2nd when uh, Washington Post, it was a style column, actually. <laughs> I mean, interestingly enough, on his Downton Abbey sort of office, and that made waves and brought a whole lot of attention to him. Adam, I mean, PR 101, again, Ben Cole is gone, the guy who'd done this, <laughs> but um, he... PR 101 would say, don't make a big deal to a reporter, right, when, you, when you've got something to hide. Or maybe also don't paint your walls bright red if you are looking to not get attention for the free interior decorating service you had, huh? I think that office was probably the most ost ostentatious of in Congress. And I think that's what makes it so surprising. We're all kind of waiting for another shoe to drop, and we just don't know what it will be because taken on its face, it was it was silly and ridiculous ridiculous and it cost $40,000 and when he wrote a reimbursement check a few weeks later I think I, I took that as an admission of guilt and you thought oh boy if he's writing that check he's saying okay you got me I'm sorry let's make this go away and then it was just little thing after little thing after little thing and here we are talking about an accumulation of really as Patrick said relatively not very harmful things. There have, there have been politicians who've done a lot worse and either stayed in office or fought it and gone back to office and I think that's why, as I said, we're just waiting for something else because we're used to politicians who fight tooth and nail to stay in office. I will fight this and we will work on this. I apologize. I will do better, et cetera. And really, this was a quick white flag and, uh, and, and just kind of waiting to see what will happen. Well, for a really ambitious guy, I mean, let's be clear, again, going back to his early career, you don't become the youngest member of, he's no longer, but when he was first elected to Congress, you don't 
get that way by accident. It's not like he came from a political family. He had worked his tail off. And I know I've seen a lot that has called him more of a show horse than a workhorse. And that may be the case, not really known for any big policies or bills getting through in D.C. But his constituents seemed to really like him and care about him. He first won his seat in the Illinois House against Rick Sloan. She was an incumbent Democrat. It, he wasn't supposed to win that seat either. He's a hard worker. So what, Andy? Um, hard workers don't have time for paperwork? I mean, that, <laughs> that seems like what a lot of this is. Uh, I mean, you can chalk some of it up, perhaps, to the youth, the inexperience, not realizing how this would all sort of play out if it ever got uh, exposed to the light. Um, you could also say that, you know, maybe he didn't have a lot of policy initiatives uh, that he was known for, but in these days, uh, in this Congress, who does anymore, right? It's, it's not uh, like it's easy it, to it's get a not, bill through. It's, it's, it's not. not easy. You can introduce the mm -hmm. bills. It's not real easy to get significant legislation through Congress right now. Um, but I, I think it's interesting, as you guys notice, he, or as you said, he, this is a guy who had some media savvy. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of part of the element of surprise. And then to go from February 2nd, the Downton Abbey, uh, Abbey office to you know, this week where he's waving the white flag, it really was uh, sort of a remarkably quick downfall for him. And the other thing too, though, is looking forward to his replacement or mm -hmm. potential replacement. We've seen State Senator Darren LaHood, who is obviously mm -hmm. um, the, the son of Ray LaHood, Aaron Chalk's predecessor. Um, you know, it, it's a candidate who um, is a, gonna be a little bit more conservative than Aaron Schock. Uh, you talked about his district liking him quite a bit, uh, and that's true. But it's a very conservative district, and shock relative to the rest of the GOP, a little bit more moderate. Um, so it'll be so. interesting to see well, how yeah, that I, we'll, we'll get more to what comes next. I feel like we still have plenty to explore, however, <laughs> <laughs> with what happened to get to this point. So, um, yeah, let's save that. Let's kind of run down the list. We had the Downton Abbey, and then there was a trip for staff to New York and to some sweet concerts. Yeah, we had a selfie with Ariana Grande. Grande, I don't know. <laughs> Makes me want a coffee. Okay, um, <laughs> we had then chartered the questions, uh, chartered planes, helicopters all over the place, including from a Springfield, uh, there's a Springfield connection there because it's Jeffrey Green who has a dealership. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to land deals, again, involving Mr. Green potentially, or for sure, I mean, that's what records show, but we don't know, again, not necessarily any laws broken mm -hmm. per se, but. It's kind of interesting to note that, um, and I'm not alleging any sort of wrongdoing on Mr. Green's part, but he was also involved in the, um, many of the business dealings of uh, Jeffrey, um, I forget his last name now, but the THR and Associates, he was basically um, found in court to have um, basically taken a lot of money and not paid any uh, taxes to the IRS. Um, and so he's had his hands in a lot of things, and um, it's interesting to see his name pop up again with, in relation to Shock's um, mini scandal. Mm -hmm. And so this is now questions about campaign donors and land deals mm -hmm. and Congressman Schock had gotten uh, taken out a loan from a bank owned by another campaign donor where for double what he'd paid for this land. It's unknown what he wanted a $600,000 mortgage for and all sorts of questions there. And then finally, it came out also that he had submitted reimbursement for basically 90,000 miles more on his personal vehicle than he'd actually driven on said vehicle. Uh, Tahoe that Guess who we bought it from, Pat? Mr. Green. There we go. Um, and so, uh, so there's all of this. Is there anything that sticks out to you? Is the the you know nail in the coffin for this really media savvy, relatively popular guy? Or it's the accumulation to me. It's the and I think this is this is what the voters are having a hard time wrapping their head around is. PR firms talk about optics. You talk about what it looks like. We can talk about legality, and that may become a major issue in the coming weeks. But we can also talk about, does it look right? Is it right? Is it right to the people? 
And, uh, and I think, as, as Andy talked about, Darren LaHood kind of stepping into this role already uh, this week, announcing he's first running. And secondly, speaking as a candidate, I'm going to be in this district. Uh, you need to talk to your people. You need to be here. You need to be back and forth from your district to Washington. And it seemed like he was saying all these things to Aaron Schock without saying Aaron Schock's name, because I think he was really addressing the difficulty he had with Aaron Schock's term in the 18th district is, just not doing things that, that maybe your, your people would be proud of, your voters would be proud of, or understand. For, I think there's a real disconnect. Really for the dist I mean, Peoria, Illinois, Central Illinois, you got a hardworking Corn Belt, and then a jet-setting congressman who's been on the cover of Men's Health magazine for his abs, he, who charters private jets and has flown around the world to India, has dined with the Prince of England. Uh, you know, I mean, just this luxury lifestyle. And I, I don't know, is, is there just a divide these days between politicians and the people that they represent? You see a lot of people that are relatively wealthy in Congress. Is this just... Aaron Schock made the mistake of posting it all over Instagram and Facebook instead of keeping it to himself and en enjoying the good life. Well, it's interesting. I, I, there does seem to be a, uh, a difference there between the, the congressman and his, and his constituent once you sort of boil it down. Uh, but once he's in office, the incumbency of effect, very hard to overcome. So even once he got to Congress and started making a name for himself, um, it's, it's, I, I think that almost sometimes uh, makes the people sort of look up to that and respect that a little bit. I mean, like you said, you have How are you not jealous of that, right? right? I mean, well, those pictures look not awesome. Not just being <laughs> jealous of it also, but also having that sort of unique representative. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is a guy that came from Peoria. This is a guy that came from central Illinois. And he made something of himself. And is doing well, is on the cover of GQ or you know, all the magazines. He's got this very popular Instagram account, like you said. Uh, and it's Peoria, Illinois, which is the metaphor for average everyday you, America. You say Peoria. Uh, right. right. <laughs> so if, if it plays in Peoria, it plays with average, uh, average folks. So I, I think um, even if you can kind of read into it that there's that difference there, I, I think a lot of people probably liked that and admired that about him. It does make you m mystified, though, right? When, when you are a millionaire, and as somebody who isn't one, there's a lot about that lifestyle that I just don't understand. But what is the big deal? Why do you, why do you even get reimbursed? I mean, you know, you're a fiscal conservative that says people are spending too much money. And so why are you, I mean, not saying that you, you don't deserve to be reimbursed for mileage that you have, but I, I, I think to me, that's one of the striking things is the kind of the continual pattern of charging taxpayers and or his campaign when he's a wealthy guy himself, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you can obviously make the argument that, you know, I'm doing this as a public service, and so, you know, since it, it is my mm -hmm. time and, and, you know, my life that I'm giving to, to you, the people, I deserve, you know, some recompense for, for the resources that I'm using. But by the same token, he is one that, um, and part of my, Lots you know. austerity cut back? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's really, he was really big about grandstanding and saying, you know, we need to make sure there's, um, you know, no people taking advantage of entitlements and uh, we need to cut this, cut that, you know. And anytime somebody said, you know, we need, we need to cut back the size of the federal government, he was right there in the mix saying, yeah, let's do that. But when it comes to my piece of the pie, well, I mean, we'll cut it back after I get what I, you know, what's owed to me, yeah. you know. I think about Springfield's own Dick Durbin who has several roommates in Washington. You think about the difference there, and, and that may be a strategy, but we know he actually lives in a house with several other, other lawmakers in Washington. And it's just the way it comes across. And that's why I guess I was so surprised that, that Aaron Schock resigned is I thought the same hubris, uh, the, the same braggadocio that, that led to this lifestyle, I thought that would continue through whatever charges he may face. Uh, would, Everything that made him so successful. I mean, he was a prodigious fundraiser. Again, his business acumen that made him a millionaire. Really, I think almost when he entered Congress, he was not your average kid. I know uh, one of our colleagues 20s. had done a, an interview with him back during the Republican National Convention two years back and asked, hey, did you ever collect baseball cards? And he said, no, um, it, it, because there wasn't enough money in it. And it, it was as a kid. So I, it, 
don't know. At the same time, I think it can be easy to for people to almost like take glee. You've seen some of these comments, and people are like, "Yeah, great, he's out of there." I think it's been hard. And you watched. I um, did see the TV interview with his father, Dr. Richard Schock, and it's hard to watch when somebody goes through that, and even if it is deserved. Um, his dad said he'll be successful in a couple of years, in 10 years, or in two. Two years. If he's not in jail. Yeah, that was kind of a, um, you know, a shock when, I mean, it, not really a shock, but, you know, when he said that, it's kind of like, you kind of get the sense that people who are close to him have always suspected that there's a little bit of, um, I don't know, blind ambition, like uncontrolled. Um, unchecked. Yeah, yeah, unchecked ambition that, you know, if if not harnessed correctly, can lead to trouble. And we've seen that, you know, in, in politics, you know, from day one. But it really, I mean, this whole thing is just another black eye for Illinois. I mean, that's one more, um, you know, corrupt politician, even though he's not officially been, you know, declared mm -hmm. to have been, you know, guilty of anything. Um, that's just one more it black eye. It's the whole system. Exa exactly. So what does that mean? Let's move ahead then to what comes next. Uh, represent or yeah, Congressman Schock, pardon me, will actually be done with his term March 31st. That's when his resignation will take effect. Then the governor has, I believe, five days to officially set an election, and that has to take place within about four months. So we're looking end of July. But already, I mean, the ink on my email printing out the resignation statement hadn't yet dried when we were hearing who was going to be the next congressman of the 18th district. So Andy, you've mentioned, I think the only one who is so far declared thus far, and that is State yeah. Senator Darren LaHood. Who else? Uh, it was uh, LaHood. Originally, we thought that uh, the, uh, another senator and former gubernatorial candidate, Bill Brady, would throw his hat in the ring, but he declined. Um, senator Jason Barrett. He said though his brother might be interested. His brother might be interested, uh, but he's not. Um, right. Senator Barrickman, I think, was also another rumored mm -hmm. candidate who has said, I'm not interested. Um, but he is seen as a rising star in Republican ranks. S similar type of deal, exactly. Um, and then you have, on the Democrat side, there there have been a, uh, at least a name or two thrown, thrown around out there, but I, it's really hard to see any of those candidates getting any traction in that district because as we said, I mean, this is a district that on average, I think in the last two presidential elections has picked the Republican candidates by about 11 more points than any other congressional district in America. So. Adam, couldn't there be a backlash though? I mean, Aaron Schock is a Republican, maybe the district wants to go Democrat or I don't know. I think the numbers of the past two elections that Aaron Schock has won bear out that this is a Republican's district to lose. I think we're talking, and I'd have to double check, but 74% at least in the last two elections. 74, I think, is the number. Uh, I think we, we have Senator Darren LaHood, uh, and aside from the people who bowed out, I think Jill Tracy is still a candidate at this point, though she's or not officially declared right? she's a yeah. potential candidate uh, to enter this race. But from from all the, the speeches we've heard so far from Darren LaHood, I think he's the one that Republicans at least, at least are rallying around behind the scenes, if not uh, to us yet, because it's a very strong message that we've seen just in the past few days of backing Darren LaHood um, behind closed doors and really come out, coming out and showing a strong presence, talking about we need to have someone that the voters can trust and really trying to combat any backlash before it comes. So I think it's Darren LaHood's to lose at this point. Well, and there are, I mean, of course, we have a lot of time ahead for this. And as we've seen, things in politics can change oh so rapidly, as was the case with Congressman Schock. Uh, it, it does appear that there may be a window for Democrats, maybe, 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 but then in 2016, I mean, it would be a short term. That said, if you have, say, a sitting state senator, I know John Sullivan of Rushville, Rushville, pardon me, has been mentioned, you can, you can take this chance, you can be in the running now, maybe up some name recognition, what have you, without having to give up or lose your seat in the state general assembly. So that's where there's so much more clamoring, I think, than would perhaps be if somebody had to step down to run for the seat. Thing too is we about the 120 days maximum for right. the election uh, from March 31st. 
that's a very short period to campaign, and you need somebody with name recognition who has established connections. And it's money. And money, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And it's not, this special election is not the time for someone, I think, an unknown, relatively unknown, to build a campaign and test the waters. It's a good chance to see where you would fare in two years, as you said. But if you're looking for a realistic chance to win the special election, I think it's got to be somebody who's already established. I will make this guess now, though. I'm going to be out in front. This is not the last that we have heard of Congressman Schock. Um, maybe no longer with the name Congressman there, but Aaron Schock is, as we've noted, an ambitious guy. He'll be back. Let's uh, move on to some other um, what many would characterize as shady dealings in the Illinois State House. And that is the story from Ray Long of the Chicago Tribune about a man who had made the news a couple years back. Uh, there was Steve Preckwinkle and then also David Pitchley. And these are some union leaders that had substitute taught in a Springfield school for one day each, literally a single day. And yet are drawing state pensions for that work. Uh, we just had the pension lawsuit over the major landmark bill that would reduce all state employees' pensions. Now Pitchley is going to court and with that same provision in the Constitution saying if you can't diminish pension benefits, despite the General Assembly having tried to scale back what he would get because of a law that, oh wait, they passed that allowed him to opt into the, the state retirement systems, he says, you can't do that. Who, who wants to address this? Andy, you're a legal guy. Uh, yeah, well, as you said, the same sort of clause is at play here. Uh, and from what we've seen from the, the courts, the Supreme Court, uh, is it's very hard to circumvent. I mean, regardless of the circumstances, you can look at the ongoing litigation that covers all the state employees, save for judges, uh, getting their cost of living adjustments reduced and you can say, okay, the clause makes maybe makes some sense in this situation, and then look at the instance uh, uh, with this case that was uh, just came out recently, obviously from a law years ago, and say, yeah, they should be able to get their pensions taken away. Uh, unfortunately, and in an ideal system, the law doesn't work like that. So you have to think that if the General Assembly had the rules to where he could just teach for a day and get that full uh, nice pension package uh, that he's probably got a, a decent claim on that if that was the law. Much as is that patently offensive to either of you or your viewers, readers? <laughs> Again, we want to separate the legality from the optics of it. <laughs> of course, that looks on its face. We're talking $30,000 plus, which is just an astronomical number for one day of substitute teaching. But there's, as Andy said, a, ch a good chance that this will be upheld, that it will be so found don't legal. Blame don't blame this guy. Don't blame this guy. Close the loophole. I think the, the issue now, and I haven't heard much discussion about it, is going forward, I would love to student teach for a day and maybe <laughs> look at, and, and, and how realistic yeah. would that be if other people are coming into the system based on one day of it's work? It's why people hate politics. I mean, this is this is the distrust, right? Yeah, yeah you're I mean, nodding. It, Give me more. It just like you've been saying, you know, it's the optics of it. I mean, people who don't follow the system, you know, as closely as we do, look at this and they see, you know, the the union fat cat in this case, you know, um, as as Governor Rauner likes to say, um, you know, they see him taking advantage of the system, and that just feeds into a lot of stereotypes that people already have about the system. Um, about it being corrupt and about it, you know, favoring insiders and uh, people, you know, who have their hands in the government coffers. It's, it just, it looks bad. And whether or not it is bad is another question that, you know, I'm not making a judgment call on. No, but, we're reporters. Um, we don't yeah, do that. Right. Not our place. But, I mean, it, it looks bad and it really, it undermines the legitimacy of the system. And this comes as on, um, on Thursday, pardon me, the, Rauner administration has a memo out to state agencies that advances the executive order he'd issued that tries to scale back on unions' power, at least that's again how unions view it, and by saying that fair share dues can no longer be collected after Rauner's own handpicked comptroller, Republican Leslie Munger, said no, that doesn't meet legal muster. He's come up with a new way and now says state agencies should basically 
reduce workers' paychecks by the amount of what they would be paying in these dues that go to unions for their representation. Keep it on their books, keep it in within the agency right now. So we'll see what comes of that. Unions are already crying major foul. They've got a pair of lawsuits ahead and they right now are saying this has all sorts of questions. What does it mean for people's pension benefits? What does it mean for their taxes? What is an agency doing holding on to money that its employees are legally owed? So we'll see what comes of that. Moving on to another rounder issue. I mean, we've been talking about this a couple of weeks, but he said days away for fiscal year 15. Where's the deal? Who's got an update? I don't know if we do. Yeah. I don't know if we do. <laughs> Silence is telling. Think, there we go. I, it is very telling. <laughs> I think we've had the same message from the three major players for about a month now is Governor Rauner thinks we're days away. The Speaker of the House thinks we're days away. And Senator Cullerton, Senate President Cullerton says, we're not even close and there's just a whether they're not sharing the information that they have or they're at a disconnect it, I, we're obviously not days away if we keep hearing this over the past month 2015 the the fiscal budget in 2015 we're already seeing services preparing and and furloughing employees and and uh, postponing services assuming that this will not get done in time so, so until Andy, it's that's signed, had repercussions already the, right the court reporters are one group of people that are affected by this uh, impasse uh, or this lack of deal. Uh, as Adam said, there's already been furloughs in the court system. Um, then that might mean big delays uh, for getting transcripts, official records in uh, cases where it's statutorily required, felonies, child custody cases, etc. Uh, and talking with the court reporters, you know, they're hopeful that a deal is going to happen. You talk with chief judges, they're hopeful a deal is going to happen. They're not um, uh, uh, certain and they're taking that lack of certainty and trying to be a little proactive about it. And already we're seeing a Senate Democrats saying if the current deal is one that cuts education funding, we're not into it. There has not been a meeting in a while it appears between the governor and the legislative leaders. So we'll continue to follow that and the repercussions that the budget short gap in fiscal year 15 has. That is all the time we have for this week. So thanks for joining. I'm Amanda Vinicky, State House Bureau Chief for Illinois Public Radio and WUIS. And much appreciation goes to the Law Bulletin's Andy Maloney, to the Illinois Times, Pat Yeagle, and to WICS, Adam Reif. Thanks for joining us. Check us out on Facebook. That's at Capital View Politics. Bye.